advances in emerging therapies. But the bottom idea is that I want, I often talk to patients about that there's a lot of things coming in, in Parkinson's disease and that uh, uh, I believe that in three to five years we'll have something that will slow down Parkinson's disease. But I don't have time to go into the details on why I am so positive, why am I am so excited. So I wanted to share things that are probably not in the market yet or not coming in the next two, three years. Many trials are not even available at EP here. That they're being done in Europe or places, but we'll give you an idea how deeply we are looking at this question about Parkinson's disease, how carefully and thoroughly we're looking at the microscopic level at the changes in the brain cells of Parkinson's patients to figure out how we can slow it down, how we can stop it. So it is a very complex topic. I will try to simplify it as much as possible and uh, with the likelihood that I will be inaccurate on some of the things because I am oversimplifying them. So that comes at a loss of accuracy. So uh, don't quote me exactly, but the concept is what I'm trying to, uh, to convey. Uh, many of these slides are from my scientific talks that I do. Every January, I do a grand round at the University of Nebraska talking about the updates in Parkinson's disease, what has happened in the last one year. And so a lot of these slides are from uh, from those kind of talks, uh, which means that they may look very complex, but the uh, hope is that we will all focus on the concept behind it, why, you know, what is being done, what's the importance here. So I start with 500 slides, uh, but you know, I cut it down to I think 85 or 86, but I think that's still too many. So it may be that I will skip over some of the slides as I want to focus more on that point that why is it so exciting about Parkinson's disease and then I will I, I would probably jump some of the things which now I think probably will just eat up time and take it away from other useful ideas. Um, very good. Okay, so this is my wonderful team of old. This is from 2015 or 16. So we need to update it because the team has grown significantly. And I think we had no fellows back then, and we have four fellows right now. So the team has literally doubled, including, especially the neuropsychology team has tripled. But you can see Julie Baraka, all energetic right there, and me right there, and my three mentors and partners. And Dr. Hellman right there, and then some of you know Bobby and Cindy, uh, who are our nurse case managers. We see over 6,000 patients in movement disorders clinic and 75% of that is uh, Parkinson's disease. So uh, we think we cater to about 3,500 3, or 3 to 4,000 patients with Parkinson's disease. Uh, the estimate is that there are about 20,000 patients with Parkinson's disease in Nebraska. But the known patients are probably about eight to 9,000. Uh, if you go by the database with the Parkinson's registry, uh, the number shows 13,000, but that's since last 20 years, so I expect some of the, those patients have passed away. So my estimated that's probably about 9,000 or 10,000 patients are diagnosed. So there are about 10,000 patients with Parkinson's who have not been diagnosed yet in Nebraska. Uh, and then out of those 9,000 that are diagnosed, probably 5,000 are seeing a neurologist, or about half. And those, out of those 5,000, I think we, we catered to about 70 to 80 percent of those patients with Parkinson's. Uh, that gives us a lot of opportunity and strength to focus on Parkinson's in education and research and do a lot of things by, by uh, putting things together. Um, I do work uh, quite a bit with industry, so that is my disclaimer in Parkinson's. I advise, I consult. Um, I speak on behalf of new drugs that come out. I go to meetings which are sponsored by industry, either it's a lunch or dinner. So that is my disclosure, you know, I, uh, and with the new Sunshine Act, you can actually go online and look up who's being paid how much by a different industry to give their time, take a day off of clinic and come and talk to them, uh, advise them or speak on their behalf. So I do that and all of it is part Parkinson's because that's the only thing I do. Uh, so all of this is relevant to what I'm talking today. So that is my disclosure. Take everything with a grain of salt. 
I would like to dedicate this talk um, to the memory of my father who wanted me to teach more and educate more. I was a happy clinician just seeing patients. Uh, but he pushed me on and he wanted me to teach others uh, to do better and do more for their patient. And uh, more and more I do is for his memory and for uh, him pushing me onwards. He passed away in 2016. So uh, why is it exciting Parkinson's disease? There is this website where everybody registers their trial, they're doing the research. So if you go to this website, and it's a, it's an American website, it's called clinicaltrials.gov, right at the top. And if you search with Parkinson's disease, like I did in January 2019, there were 2,193 papers published, uh, studies ongoing for Parkinson's disease. So about 2,200 trials are going on right now for Parkinson's disease, so 2000 plus. And it's probably only increased since then. And then when I uh, started reviewing the studies from last year, in 2018, 7,822 papers were published on Parkinson's disease. A lot of these are duplication of ideas, re-summarization, literature review and all of that, but many of them are original studies some are with mice, some are with even flies, as you will see later on in my talk. But interestingly, if you look at this graph that I borrowed from someone uh, who wrote an excellent website about science of Parkinson's, uh, 1865, 1865 is when we started calling it Parkinson's disease, but James Parkinson's described it in his paper in 1817. And if you take that timeline, this is 100 years, of 1817 to 1917, and then 1970-2017 was 200 years. So in 2017, we have a 200 years or bicentennial celebration of the May, the finding or description of the Parkinson's disease. And we put on all the papers that are published in thousands here. You will see how the research is accelerating. You will see how this curve is going up and up. And I think that's in itself an indication of that a breakthrough is coming. That's kind of the build-up that you see in science as things just escalate until they reach that critical threshold where we finally break in and we're able to, to solve it and, and give an answer uh, like we've done for many other diseases in the past. So that in itself is very promising. You know, if you follow the scale, it's, you know, it will probably double in the next five years or so. So from 8,000 we go to 16,000 papers and that means that someone will come up with a good idea, if, if enough people are thinking, right? Um, to me, we look at the Parkinson's research in three primary questions. One question which I think is even more important today, how do we better diagnose Parkinson's disease? You know, we're just looking at our patients and trying to make a diagnosis in a clinic, which is kind of a guess. Uh, we get better at guessing. Uh, you know, more likely to be right than wrong, but then, you know, it's not 100% perfect science, and we all accept that. And then not only that, if I give a medication to my patient with Parkinson's, and next time, three months later, they come back, I have to just go by what they say, if the medication worked, didn't work, what their impression is overall of the last three months. So that has to be a very rough change to be able to, to pick it up. And that means that a lot of this get missed um, on day-to-day -day variation, what times of the day it's working, on how many days in a week it's working, and questions like that. And we, uh, we should look at how to do those things better. The second question is how can we slow down this disease, which I think is even more important question. Let's say we have made the diagnosis, how can we slow down and stop the progression of disease? And then the third question, which is becoming less and less relevant, as you can see in my list on option three, I have nothing listed there. Because I, in the past, have not paid any attention to it, but now I'm starting to participate in this, which is, how can we treat the symptoms better? Uh, you know, I think there are enough medication treatments available that we can make almost all Parkinson's patients better, uh, but there's always room to get something which works even better. But um, in the last few years, the medications have come out which help improve symptoms that we were not treating before and which are what we call the non-motor symptoms of Parkinson's. 
So we were treating tremor and we were treating stiffness and, and maybe somewhat walking problem. But we have nothing for low blood pressure, for sleep problem, for mood and depression Parkinson's. So we were using what everybody else is using uh, and hoping that it works for Parkinson's. And, and a lot of time it does, but what, now we're starting to come up with drugs that specifically are designed for Parkinson's patients with those problems. And I will show you a few examples if we have enough time. So how do we diagnose Parkinson's patients better? So we are trying to look at modern technology. Uh, wearable devices, watch, phones, sensors to see as they live with us day and night can we use them more reliably to get information for every second of the patient and see uh, what is going on with Parkinson's. Uh, in the past the problem had been that the data was just too much, it became a noise and we could not figure out the patterns out of it. But now we have devices, so we are part of a study with uh, this device, we're clinically using it too. This is the older version, there's a newer version available now. But this device is a watch which has movement sensor. So anytime you move the hand, it senses it. It senses the acceleration or speeding up of movement and then deceleration or slowing up the movement. So it's basically an accelerometer which uh, picks up positive and negative acceleration. So anytime we move, it, it tells that the hands have moved. And then what the doctors have done, researchers have done smartly is that they measure the movements over two, min two minutes and then they look at how much movement was going on on average in the two minutes and they compare it with people who don't have Parkinson's and then they can tell on average in the two minute this patient was moving less than someone else who would have been moving for two, over two minutes and then on average this person was moving too much so that can pick up the slowness, bradykinesia and um, too much movement or what we call dyskinesia. And then it adds what is called the peak uh, movement. So peak movements, if someone is dyskinetic and moving too much, the peak movements or the fastest movement in the last two months is much higher than a fast movement of someone just you know, walking around and doing something with their hands. Um, so th there's a lot of mathematical calculation that goes into it, but with training over time, probably using an artificial intelligence uh, and, and learning system back in the clouds, this uh, company has become really good in getting an idea that over a day, a Parkinson's patient is he moving as much as a normal person, not enough or too much. So there's these two graphs, the, the green one and the, and the blue one, and the uh, green one is too much movement. So anytime you see the, the graph shot up, go to a high peak, meaning that there are times the patient is moving too much, and similarly the blue one is not enough movement, so this line says that they're doing okay until it's time for their medication which is the red line and then suddenly they, their movement goes down and they're having much less movement. So they get better in the middle, then they fall off at the medication, then they get better with the medication, then they fall off the fourth mm -hmm. medication. So it's becoming better and better. We still don't know how to take this information and make a decision about medication changes and that's what our participation in the research is about. It's called Target PD and we will be <coughs> doing these analysis on all of our Parkinson's patients. Half of them I, we will be using to make a decision on medication change, other half will just treat traditionally, just asking the patient are you doing okay, do we need to change the medication, are you feeling fine. We'll do it over a two, a two years period and we'll see can using this information improve uh, patient satisfaction outcome benefits or not. Um, there is other devices that can measure too, so that is just one company. The hardware is the same, but the difference is that the previous company have built their own formula to use to analyze the data, uh, but the data can be taken up raw from sensors in other watches, which is the same sensor actually, it's the same uh, military grade accelerometer mm -hmm. that almost everyone uses, including iPhone has the same military grade accelerometer which has a 98% accuracy of movement detection. Um, so in, you know, even phone can be used as a, as a tool. Um, we are partnering with UNO which do, which are trying to build their own algorithm on figuring out the data from the watch. So we have done a couple of studies uh, with UNO biomechanics department uh, in uh, capturing that kind of data and see if that can be made to pick up when the patients with Parkinson's freeze. As they're going into the car to drive, 
were they in a good state, were they in a bad state, if at that drive they had an accident, does that correlate back to the watch data? Can a watch give them an alarm, don't drive right now, kind of an idea, uh, things like that. So that projects are going on and now we're partnering with University of Rochester, which has a, a department designated to develop medical devices. Dr. Ray Dorsey heads that and he's also the advisor for Parkinson's disease to, I think, Apple uh, and many other companies. So Dr. Ray Dorsey is launching a project which is called Watch PD uh, from Watch. Uh, and he is also trying to look at uh, the same thing but not using the company's algorithm but in the raw data and, and building his own algorithm. So we'll be, we have applied to be a center and we're going through discussions uh, and trying to get selected as a site to be on the Watch PD trial. So we'll be doing two trials on wearable devices to see if we can pick it. And then my own personal interest is using a smartphone. So I built this app uh, a year ago uh, to see, uh, you know, I look for finger tapping all the time and your doctors do. And then I want to do the same tapping but on the phone to see if the tapping speed and regularity on the phone changes with Parkinson and does that correlate with the timing of medication with a UPDRS score that we do and things like that. So I will be uh, working with our fellows to start an IRB project to pick up and uh, have you guys tap on the smartphone to see uh, if that helps uh, give us information that is useful. And then lastly, we have a wonderful driving lab, state of the art. We partnered with Toyota Japan uh, for that. Dr. Rizzo, our department chair, heads the lab and he's also the national advisor for safety in driving uh, for dementia and Parkinson's disease. Uh, and we just completed a study where we had, I think, 20 patients uh, have uh, a device in their car as they drove around for a month doing their routine activities and we captured their driving data, plus they were wearing the watch with UNO partnership, plus they were doing other testing for us and plus we had the clinical data on them. And now we're going to see that uh, if there are ways to pick up the effect of Parkinson's on driving, Right now we don't have any, so there is no way to guide on what to do about driving or when to stop driving or when to limit. So the best thing we have right now is the uh, OT assessment, um, occupational therapist assessment of driving, where they sit with you, putting their life at risk, and see if you can uh, make it safe back or not. Uh, but we'll see if there are better ways uh, to, to monitor it and capture it uh, in our study. So that's new and exciting about the diagnosis of Parkinson's and management of Parkinson's. That brings me to the second topic of research where I will take a little bit more time. On the first topic I focus only on the four studies that we are doing. There is a lot more being done but uh, I, that would require a separate talk on itself on what more is being done for better diagnosis of Parkinson's. Um, but on this topic uh, we are doing a lot, and again we have four trials that we are part of in, on this topic, but I want to expand this topic and talk about what others are doing, which is notable and very significant uh, in the field of Parkinson's. So, so that we are all on the same page, Parkinson's disease is a loss of brain cells in the brain. It is loss of a very specific type of brain cell which makes dopamine, and that's why dopamine goes down. This is a section through a human brain at the bottom where we call the brain stem. So it's like a stem where the brain sits on. And even in a normal healthy brain, if you make a slice, you see this black area, which is called the black substance or substantia nigra. And this black area contains these uh, neurons which make dopamine. It is black because these neurons have melanin, the same things that give black color to your skin when you tan. So it's the same exact pigment if they have same origin, melanin, and this is normal and healthy. In a Parkinson's patient, these cells specifically die, and you will see that in a Parkinson's disease brain, uh, there in the lower picture down here, there is no black substance visible uh, in, in that area. And these are the brain cells we're trying to save uh, with our therapies. These are those brain cells uh, that you see. Uh, this is a neuron, a brain cell. This is that melanin pigment. It is staining brown, rust color because of the iron the melanin pigment contains. So uh, that's why we know these are the uh, black substance neurons. <coughs> uh, no other neuron in the brain has black substance. And this pink accumulation is what we think uh, is uh, the problem that kills or happens due to dying of this brain cell. 
So the one sensor is working fine, but it has already formed these Dewey bodies, which means that it's on the path to die. These pink substances were described by Dr. Louis, that's why they're called Louis bodies, and these Louis bodies are made of a special protein, which is called alpha synuclein, uh, and it's the acute, the protein is present normally in the brain, normally it is soluble, and you don't see it in the cell, so normal cell, this cell also has alpha synuclein on the top one, but it has no Louis bodies because the protein is all dispersed, diffused, dissolved. It's the protein when it starts clumping up into large clumps, that's when it becomes a problem, and it cannot be processed anymore by the cell and stresses the cell, and those are the Louis bodies. The Louis bodies in the brain slowly progress, so although we talked about only the black substance, but they start even lower than the black substance, so uh, the slice was uh, somewhere up here that we just saw in the brainstem, at the top of the brainstem, but the problem may actually start at the bottom of brainstem and then gradually progress uh, over time to go up and up and eventually go the whole brain uh, surface and, uh, and that's where we can start seeing problems with memory, thinking, hallucinations and, and cognition. The, um, and now many of us uh, are starting to think that maybe the problem doesn't start in the brain but it starts in the gut and then is gradually pushed towards the brain either that the Lewy bodies start in the gut and then they <coughs> get transmitted into the brain and the Lewy bodies start forming in the brain or it may be that there are signals in the gut uh, through interaction with the environment which leads to the Lewy body formation in the brain. So Lewy bodies have been found in the gut but uh, not 100% uh, patients and, um, and it's still not clear if those Lewy bodies somehow get transmitted to the brain so many of us including me are still skeptic and it may be that uh, uh, new bodies don't get transmitted but the stress in the gut through many various factors so this is a one interaction diagram and on the right of this picture you'll see the gut microbes or the bacteria in the gut which we think is the primary common factor that unites all the other factors such as coffee, smoking, milk, diet, everything somehow interplays with the bacteria in our gut to finally influence uh, the formation of Lewy bodies in the gut and maybe in the brain. Okay, so neuroprotection has been very tough for us. Uh, it's not that we have not tried. We have tried and failed so many times. It's, it's embarrassing to share, but uh, we, the last trial that failed was last year that I was part of, or actually this year. Uh, this is uh, just a list of the top significant trials that have failed and you can see that number N is the uh, number of patients that were recruited in a study and it's usually cost about twenty to thirty thousand dollars to recruit one patient in a trial to give you an idea. So 800 in the first one, 54, 101, 321, 79, 79, 371 and 380, 82, 86, so 1084 uh, in that trial and in 319 to this list actually stops at about 2010 and then there are at least four more trials, four or five that have failed since then uh, and as I said the last one failed this year, uh, the short PD trial. So it has been really hard to find something to slow down for kids. Maybe we were not asking the right questions, we were not looking at the right picture or maybe we don't know how to uh, tell when the Parkinson's has actually slowed down, which I think is the primary problem. That a lot of these chemicals that were tested failed to show that they slowed down Parkinson's because they were slowing down Parkinson's but we just couldn't tell because we didn't have a proper way to tell that the Parkinson's slowing down. But hopefully that will gradually change and will get better. Uh, so what are our current questions that we're looking at that give us hope and idea that we are uh, trying to find an answer? One uh, is calcium. Calcium plays a central role in damage to any body cell. When the cell death occurs, the brain body cell dies, then the calcium is the final trigger, is the final bullet or, or the trigger for that's pushed to blast the cell. 
And now we're no longer seeing that calcium is playing an essential role in Parkinson's patients too. A paper published last year looked at these alpha synuclein dissolved soluble versus the large accumulation in the cells uh, of this fish, which uh, uh, has a special protein called bar albumin. So it's a very special kind of albumin in fish, and that protein uh, had the ability to keep the alpha synuclein from clumping, so it can prevent formation of the Lewy bodies. But it was much more effective if there was not too much calcium inside the cell, and the effectiveness of that protein went down as there were more and more calcium inside the cell. So that again supported our idea that calcium in the cell is not a good idea. We already had started a trial. Dr. Bertoni is the PI for this trial at uh, UNMC. It's called Steady PD, which is taking a calcium blocker and giving it to Parkinson patient. Calcium blockers are used for blood pressure because uh, calcium into the blood cell in the cells of the blood vessels causes hypertension or supports the tightness of blood vessels. No calcium blocker medication crosses into the brain except one. So of all the calcium channel blockers that we have, and we have many, only one happens to cross into the brain, but actually only a tiny, small amount. And so it was already available. So we thought, why don't we give that calcium blocker? It will go into the brain. It will stop that calcium going into the brain cells, and maybe that will slow down Parkinson's because calcium will be less inside the Parkinson cells or in the dopamine cells, and it will slow down the clumping of the living bodies. The trial is ongoing. I am. Um, not sure. My impression is that the trial has not been very successful, uh, but it has not been a complete failure either. So the trial is still ongoing, uh, unlike my trial that was completely stopped. So study PD the results are supposed to be out uh, sometime this year. Movement Disorder Society meeting is uh, next month in France, and I am expecting there will be a big announcement about this trial in that meeting uh, in France. Another uh, study that was published last year showed that the calcium regulation or control of calcium inside the brain cells of Parkinson's patient was impaired. So we knew calcium was bad, we knew calcium going in was not good, a study showed that earlier, and now we know that the brain cells actually not able to handle calcium which are dying with Parkinson's, or Parkinson's brain cells. So that also supports the idea that because they're not able to handle the calcium, calcium comes in too much and then those protective mechanisms that were supposed to protect against the Lewy bodies uh, probably have uh, a high likelihood of not working very well. So that paper was published and this is that mechanism channel or where the calcium regulation happens inside a cell. And then the most uh, remarkable paper last year, the, these are microscopic worms, they're called uh, C. elegans. These elegans worms, these are, these are under microscope. Um, and they've been stained with these special fluorescent dyes you know, genetically so that we can pick up things in them. They were given an uh, inhibitor for that abnormal calcium enzyme. So in the last slide I showed you that there is a dis dysfunction and they have this complicated name called CIRCA, which is the calcium regulating uh, a, a protein enzyme in the, in the brain cells. So they took these elegans, they created Parkinson's in them, then they gave them the inhibitor for that circa called cyclopiazonic acid. And they found that they can slow down the Parkinson's mechanism in these worms if they give the calcium enzyme inhibitor. So building the idea that maybe if we can find a way to get the calcium inhibitor, enzyme inhibitor, or low calcium in the brain cells of Parkinson's, we would probably be able to slow down or, or lower the speed of progression of Parkinson's. So we are, so this is a cell, and there are many components to it. This one component highlighted here is what we call mitochondria, which is the um, powerhouse of the cell or the, the factory to produce electricity. It produces all the electricity needed for the cell to run the air conditioning mm -hmm. and uh, you know, run uh, the transport system and everything else. So this has a central implication in Parkinson's. 
we think that all the stress that happens on the Parkinson cells, including that Lewy bodies, impair the function of this mitochondria and the cell does not have enough energy and this starts going into long time shutdowns. The, the, the electricity just goes out and the cell mechanisms start becoming disrupted, the trash collection stops and there is trash everywhere and, and, and slowly the buildings start crumbling, crumbling and the cell dies. So we will see it being targeted in some of these studies, but just wanted to highlight in this next picture is that we're making every effort possible to figure out Parkinson. So this is a scientist in space, up, up in the air, you know, in the space station, and they took alpha-synuclein proteins with them up in the space and wanted to see if the clumping of that alpha-synuclein into Lewy bodies would be any different in space, and would that give us some answers or clues that we cannot get it here because of, you know, the gravity is being pervasive everywhere and maybe if we take them far away from Earth, they will uh, clump together in different ways and they will give us some an answer. The idea failed. There was no different in alpha nuclear behavior in space, so gravity does not seem to have any role to it, but, you know, it will probably a few million dollars spent to figure that out. <laughs> So, uh, we're looking at the really, really tiniest levels of brain, of the brain cells. This area that is being pictured here, the microscopic picture and then the cartoon diagram of the cells that are making these, all these dots on the microscopic picture on the left, is the area where the dopamine is actually released. So the black area is where dopamine is produced, it's sent through these long connections, and then it goes to a part of the brain which we call basal ganglia, globus pallidus, you know, cutamen, striatum, you would have many names like that, but that's the area where the dopamine is actually released. And this cartoon here of the cell shows you how many connections in different parts of the brain are coming together to interplay and create a final answer from down here. This integration is what makes the movement precise, reliable. And it's the loss of that integration that somehow one thing breaks down. Boy, it is sometimes worse and I go again. The loss of this integration is supposed to create all kinds of movement problems. So tremors and Parkinson's and dystonia and spasticity and muscle spasm, chorea, ticks. All of this becomes because these central processing units which are taking information from many different sources, putting it together. You can see how complex this process is. Each cell has about a thousand to ten thousand of these connecting towers on the cell. And each tower has anywhere from a hundred to a thousand input to one tower. And then there are about thousand to ten thousand towers for one cell. And then that cell will give one in output. And by taking in all that information. And information is coming over. And that's where the dopamine goes in, is that these towers have knobs. You can see the knobs on the tower. Knobs is where most of the input comes in, but at the connection or stack of the knob is these connections which release <coughs> dopamine. So dopamine does not give one input, it controls the inputs coming into the tower. So it in itself is not just a simple input like everything else, it's not just one plus one plus one plus one. All the t hundred or thousand inputs that come into the tower are being controlled how much wants to go into the tower house. So dopamine plays a much more central role of this integration. And that's why dopamine is so important. That all the other integration is dependent or controlled or regulated by the dopamine. The dopamine tells, okay, keep 70% of these, keep 30% of that, keep 80% of that. And that's where it makes the most important function of making the movements very precise, very effective, and having a movement memory or movement emotions. So how excited you become from something is also managed by dopamine. So dopamine tells you, okay, no, this is not to get very excited about, or no, no this is wonderful, let's jump with joy. So what's happening in that area is that some of those tower cells, what we call stellate cells, um, or integra integrating cells or interneurons. Neuron is a cell or a brain cell, an interneuron we say are the neurons that interconnect other neurons. Some of them have dual functions and they 
in addition to being very positive, they can be very negative. So they can be very excited or they can be very sad. So they can support something, they can innovate something. Those dual cells become impaired or abnormal in Parkinson's patient. They cannot handle negativity very well. They become overly negative when the neg negative input comes in. And the study used in cell cultures, a drug we always had for diuretic called bumetanide to see if we can reverse that excessive negativity of the cell. And the study was very positive. The cells started acting more normally. They will respond equally to positive and negative input and not become overly negative. And that again gives us an idea that maybe that's something could be tried. But not even that. This science just came out last year, 2018. In 1970s, some genius neurologist like me <laughs> already tried the bumetanide on Parkinson's patient on four patients. And they wrote a paper and said, hey, a report of four cases, I'm using this bumetanide and it seems to be helping the patients. And then it got lost, it was like, okay, explain how it's helping. And of course he has no idea because all these concepts and mechanisms were not even discovered that there is over negativity of the cell and that can be reversed by bumetanide, which actually does not work on calcium, works on chloride and chloride is what controls the negativity and this and that. And now we know, but that gives you an idea that there are things that we have had that could be looked at uh, for answers. Another cell, which is not a dopamine cell, it's called an astrocyte. Astro means like star. So it's a star-like cell, you know, it has these long spreads. And what's its job in the brain is to support other cells. So this is the astrocyte sitting. This is the neuron, which could be a dopamine neuron. This is a cell which covers the extensions of neuron, you know, with its extension. An astrocyte is just sitting there and supporting everybody else. Okay, what do you need? Okay, what do you need? What do you need? And it's helping all the cells function with each other. So they are far less than other cells, but they play a central role in supporting each of these different cells. And if there's five between two cells, they're going to calm down. What do you need? What do you need? And they will help figure it out. And what we have now learned is that these cells are the main way that the brain age. The aging of a cell, that this cell is old, what we call semi-sense, let's get rid of it, is actually being managed by these cells. And they trigger, well, this one is too old, this one is 100 years old, let's get rid of that one. And now we have found out that some of these toxins that, were, that we knew was causing Parkinson's, like parakeet, you know, we're throwing at fishes, all fish die, you just take them all out, so okay, we caught 10,000 fish. So parakeet has been linked to damaging these astrocytes and triggering these aging signals. They say, oh, everything is too, everything is suddenly 20 years old after being exposed to parakeet. And now we are looking at drugs, testing in the animals and on cell culture, which can reverse that signal and say, no, 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 this cell is not that old, it actually can be salvaged, it will be fine. And now they want to ask this question, can we try these drugs on aging diseases, like Alzheimer's, like Parkinson's, which will be the first two targets because these two are the most commonest aging diseases that happens only when you age a certain. And then, the most exciting part of the future is immunology. Many experts are starting to say that Parkinson's disease is actually an immune disease. Parkinson's disease is not a genetic disease, it's not a metabolic disease, it's an immune disease. There is an impune, immune system impairment. And half of the research these days is on the immune side of Parkinson's disease. And you will see many, many exciting things about the immune part of it, and I am if I'm going to bet on something, I'll bet on the immune therapy being the treatment for Parkinson's. I think it will eventually be that there will be immunotherapy that will fix the Parkinson's disease or make it better. Oh, this picture, by the way, is in one the, the most exciting immune therapy. We have it at the Buffett Cancer Center. It's called the CAR T cell therapy. It's when we recruit the body's own immune cells and train them to go and hunt the cancer cell. You say, okay, we don't need to give drugs anymore. We'll just train your cells to go and hunt cancer cells better and then do a 10,000 times job better than any drug that we have on the market, if they're trained right. So this is a T cell and this is a cancer cell 
and it has been trained to go find it. It'll go, and it is so precise that it, it, it will hunt this cancer cell at a cellular level. So it's not damaging anything anymore. It will only find, tag the cancer cell, destroy it. And it will be extremely precise. And I think we are one of the leaders in the CAR T cell therapy uh, in, in Buffett Cancer Center, and, um, and it's a big strength for us. And this is not in Parkinson's yet, but maybe that's where Parkinson's would go. Um, even if I, if I imagine. So what is going on in immune uh, immunology in Parkinson's? Vaccines. There are two vaccines under trial uh, in phase one. And right now phase one means they're looking at safety. You know, the vaccines we've designed, designed works in animals. But would it even be safe to give it to humans or not? And those two trials have been, one have been completed and one is ongoing in the UK. And then they are now planning one complete based on that, a phase two trial, where they will actually start looking at, okay, how effective it is in humans. It looked very effective in animals, but let's see how effective will it will actually be in humans. So two vaccines are being developed right now. Uh, they are called Effitop from Afris. It's a UK-based company. An antibody against alpha-synuclein. So anti-alpha-synuclein monoclonal antibody was tested. So this is um, uh, an uh, idea where we treat MS with antibodies, we treat rheumatoid arthritis with antibodies. Mm -hmm. So all these infusions you get are basically antibodies that go find the bad proteins or bad cells, bind them so that they can be destroyed. So we have antibody therapy successful for many uh, diseases and they're looking at an antibody that will tag that alpha synuclein and clear it out so that the alpha synuclein get removed. If the brain cell itself cannot remove the alpha synuclein, maybe it can hire a cell, an immune cell, to come and clean it out for them. So outsourcing the trash collection. And uh, that phase one again was on healthy volunteers to see if it's safe for humans to even receive something that does not exist in nature. And that was positive. The Pasadena is another antibody which is in phase two. Uh, in Prasilzumab, you will see these kind of name in MS very commonly. The last big uh, hit was this Ocrelizumab, a previous that came out and is supposed to be guard sent treatment for MS and will cure all MS or fix it. So we're working on our own Zumab, is Prasilzumab that will be a monoclonal antibody for the alpha synuclein or the uh, Lewy bodies in the brain. And then there's a list of possible antibodies in work by big companies like Biogen, which has made a big name in MS and other immune therapies and cancer immune therapy. They have a product, they have only numbers right now because they are at such a basic level uh, that they are working, and I just listed the five top ones uh, that seems to show the most promise of these antibodies or immune therapies against Parkinson's. And then NILO-PD. So NILO-PD is this, uh, again, a wonderful discovery. So NILO-PD is a study based on a cancer drug. This cancer drug works for CML, chronic myeloid leukemia. In CML patient, there is an overproduction of uh, blood cells, cancer cell. Because of the switch, there is a normal enzyme called ADL, there's a novel enzyme on called BCL. These are two different chromosomes. That there are 23 of those that make us human, and they are normally separated. But during shuffling of these chromosomes, as uh, as the uh, the babies will be formed, as the sperm cell and ovaries are being produced, sometimes the shuffling happens so that they end up together, and they form this BCR ADL gene, which you know, which is not a natural gene. And that's what causes CML in 70, 80% of people. And if that is causing the CML, then the CML is aggressive and usually does not respond to treatment. So what they have done is that they created these um, drugs which will block the, the VCR ABL gene. And that first came out, I think 20 years ago, called a DVAC, which was like a first breakthrough in leukemia, or what they call non-solid tumors. And it was the first targeted drug. It will target a very specific enzyme. And it was remarkable. It was used as a second line of the first treatment failed. And now we have three more that were produced after DVAC. And many new of those antibodies are present. But what we found 
a few years ago, uh, my work in George Washington, is that this ADL is actually overactive in dopamine cells in the brain. And may its overactivity may be speeding up the formation of the Lewy bodies. So more ABL is active, the more Lewy bodies the brain cell get. And uh, they found that majority of people with Parkinson's, first they found it in genetic people, um, the Ashkenazi Jews, which have a very specific disease called Gaucher's disease. The carriers of Gaucher's disease in New York, 10 years ago, were described to have very high risk of Parkinson's, three to four times or five times higher risk because of their carrier gene, which is not causing Gaucher, but will cause it in some generation down in the Ashkenazi Jews. But those people who are just carriers will not get Gaucher, but they were getting Parkinson's. And it was finally linked there was that gene. And that gene, GBA, overactivates ABL in those people. That was described five years ago, six years ago. So why are Gaucher gene causing Parkinson's? And they finally figured out that it's the ABL gene. And then somebody reported that even in Parkinson's patients who don't have Gaucher carrier, 70 to 80% of them have somehow an activity turned up of the ABL gene. Not as much as the Gaucher people, but more than a normal person, more than a normal person. And now, what we did that, why don't we try these drugs like Nilotinib that works on BCR ABL combination to see if it work on ABL alone. It's not combined, but it's alone. And they found it does work, that although it was designed to work on the combination for the cancer, it also works on the regular ABL to slow it down. And now they tested first in uh, George Washington on uh, 26 patients with Parkinson's in the phase one trial. It was not only shown to be safe, it was actually shown to be effective, which is rare for a phase one trial. A phase one trial is such a small number of people, 26, that you, can, you can't see benefits. You know, usually benefits are so small. But the, the drug seems to work so well that even those 26 people, their disease seemed to slow down. And now there are two phase two trials going on, one by Michael J. Fox Foundation and one by the Georgetown people who originally described it. And Nilo PD is the one with Michael J. Fox Foundation. We almost made it to Nilo PD except for the last hitch uh, that we could not come over, did not, could not convince our ILB team. But this trial is going on and uh, we are looking, first half is completed and we should see the results in the next few months of the first half on how effective this drug is. Some practitioners anecdotally think it is working really well. So I ran into this expert of Huntington's disease who uh, practices, very, very famous Huntington's expert, who practices in uh, Seattle, I believe. And she said there is a patient who buys it internationally somewhere, a rich guy, he flies, gets it, brings it in and takes it, and he's doing great. But you know, there's those anecdotal evidences, but we'll see what the actual study shows. That's that mechanism that ABL caused Parkinson's, I'll skip that. And then, we also looked at another proper immune therapy. So these are the results from Dr. Gettleman's study at UNMC, where we went to the cancer concept. We said, how if we activate our cells, rather than giving these antibodies, if we can activate our immune cells, just like we do for cancer patients, how would that be effective? Would that work for Parkinson? Would that slow it down? So he took this drug, leukine, which activates the immune cells in a certain way, and uh, it was given to Parkinson's patient, 12 Parkinson's patients, I believe. And of course, it was a phase one study to mostly look at F or safety, uh, and to show that the safety is as about for any other patient, and is not worse for Parkinson, and that he was able to show, which is this paper published, but he also saw a lot of positive measures to say that it is actually uh, potentially slowing down Parkinson's, uh, in, uh, even in phase one. And then I think he has started a phase two trial. I was part of phase one, but I'm not part of phase two. Uh, I think it's ongoing because one of my patients was approached to be recruited, uh, and uh, he will now be looking at the actual benefits out of this immune activation therapy to see if it can slow down Parkinson's. And then, um, another idea is what we call package delivery. So dopamine cells have a specific enzyme that helps them make dopamine. And that's why other cells cannot make dopamine. They don't have that enzyme. And the dopamine cells are dying, so we have to give dopamine. What if we can train other cells to make dopamine? 
what if you send that enzyme delivered to those cells somehow and those cells will then take it up and say okay yeah we know how to do it we can make dopamine and this is that study the way to deliver the genetic information to a cell is through viruses viruses are tiny enough they can penetrate small cells without damaging them they have this ability to deliver a message that gets read <coughs> it gets integrated into the cell that gets infected by the virus this is how HIV happens you know HIV uh, cells which are viruses go and infect all these immune cells and then it it takes a message and those messages gets read and followed the message is very simple take more of me so it's that you know it's not that message that we want to spread you know just take make more of my me make more of my viruses but a specific message uh, about making more dopamine and that process is ongoing the right now the technique is that the virus has to be injected into the brain tissue where you want the dopamine to be produced because they don't have a good penetrance body has such a strong defense mechanism it does not let viruses just roam around and go to where they want to go so we have to inject them in eight patients were injected in a trial to get benefit and then another company said well why send one enzyme to make dopamine it takes three steps to make dopamine that means that we still only use cells that have other two steps why don't we set all three steps so that every cell can make dopamine it doesn't have to be those who have the first two steps. So now this company is using a bigger virus, so it can package in three genes, three enzymes, to send in to say, okay, make dopamine. And once infected, that area will start making a lot of dopamine. And our hope is that once that dopamine is being produced, it will be it will be used naturally uh, because the the use customer is already there. It's just the seller is dying. Customer uh, has no change. The customer doesn't die, so he will say, "Okay, if that guy is not selling me dopamine, and this new area is now starting to sell me dopamine. Let me just use that one and do fine. We'll see how that goes." Seven fifty thousand. So it's a huge number, right? But that's how many chemicals pharmaceutically exist in this world that are known to be pharmaceutically active on humans. Can be treated as my potential medication. So one consortium said, let's test every single one of them on Parkinson's cells. So they ran tests for every single one of them. It was a large project. And they found that for 57 of these 750,000 drugs actually have targets on the areas which now we know is implicated in Parkinson's. You know, I mentioned some of those areas, right? We talk about talk about mitochondria, calcium channel, endoplasmic reticulum, ADL, this and that. So they came up with 57 drugs. And then they found that 17 of those 57 already have case reports suggesting that they may slow down Parkinson's. So people were hinting that, hey, I think it probably makes sense, but they had no clue why. It was case reports, individual opinions, but those 17, what part of these 57 that screened positive on this huge screen, 750,000 drugs were screened. And, to say, and then now they have these 57 candidates, existing candidates that could potentially sort out Parkinson. And 17 are already tagged by others to say, yes, this could work, this could work. So there are many interesting candidates. So for example, Dr. Bertoni, my mentor, described that melanomas are more common in Parkinson, the only cancer which is more common in Parkinson's than other people without Parkinson's is melanoma. All other cancers are less in patients with Parkinson's. An anti-melanoma drug, Deprofenib, is one of those 57 drugs that has been identified. So a drug that treats melanoma, and remember, the black substance is black because of the same melanin, which is present in melanoma. It's a common thread. They have an iron-containing melanin and in melanoma. In them. So there is an interaction with that melanoma somehow that could potentially slow down Parkinson. So that was one of the findings. Another finding was green tea, the matcha green tea, or Japanese green tea, has a special substance called EGG, EGCG, epiglectocatechin, which is now considered as a neuroprotective for Parkinson. So Japanese green tea. Uh, 
So I want to take a few more minutes to come back down to the current state of Parkinson's. You know, this is vision of the future. This is why I am excited about Parkinson's, where I think it will be a big breakthrough within the next few years. So most of the treatments that have been approved or newly approved for Parkinson's are for the symptoms of Parkinson's, not for slowing down Parkinson's. We don't have anything shown so far. But as I mentioned earlier, many of the new drugs are starting to address the non-motor symptoms, the things like thinking and cognition and blood pressure and mood and hallucinations and things like that. So he, these are a few of those. And then, of course, we used to have this deep brain simulation system that worked very well for us, which is the Medtronic. But now two other companies came up with their enhanced and modified versions of the deep brain simulation to show us what else could be done with DBS. And now there's a lot of research going into what could be done in future with DBS, and some of that is very exciting, very exciting. Uh, this is a connection that I was showing earlier, and that connection is where dopamine is being released and being absorbed. This is what we're trying to fix, mostly, for the motor symptoms. And there are many ways to fix it. So we give levodopa. It goes into the brain and gets accepted by the cell that can convert it into dopamine and then it's released. We can give drugs that make this dopamine last longer in the connection so that it can work more effectively and get recycled more. And then we have drugs that can block its destruction of the levodopa in the blood or in the gut so that it stays longer and works longer in the body. So that, that's kind of the common mechanism, right? The problem that we face mostly in Parkinson's is that drugs work very well in the beginning. They are going up and down in the blood, but we don't care, we don't figure it out. But as the disease progresses, these ups and downs start causing a lot of problems. If it's too much, it's causing dyskinesia or hallucination or lightheadedness. If it's not enough, then it's making you freeze and not move and, and shake. And we need to find ways to fix that. So, levodopa inhaler is finally out. It took, it was nine years in the making. Uh, I was almost given up, but it is available in the market. Like all inhaler, it is a rescue therapy. So you keep it with you, you inhale when you need to just quickly turn on in five minutes. And it does work that way. Then you take it out, you put the capsule in and you inhale. The only difference with the other inhaler is that you have to inhale the drug has no gas pressure inside to push the drug into you. Other inhalers, you just press a button and there's a pressure gas and they push the drug into you. This one does not. So you have to make a big effort to pull the drug in, but once you put it in, it will kick in in five to 10 minutes and, and the uh, off period is gone, but it only lasts for an hour, hour and a half, 90 minutes or so. The cinnamon pump is now available <coughs> and uh, where we can infuse the cinnamon continuously, so ups and downs are gone. Uh, in uh, new pumps are on the way, as I will show you later, uh, and that's how the pump is connected to the tubing and is carried around. Uh, new drug for hallucination for Parkinson is out. We were borrowing drug for hallucinations from psychiatry for bipolar disorder and schizophrenia. They were either not effective or not safe for Parkinson's, but those were the only things we had. And now we have a one first drug specifically designed and approved for Parkinson's, and right now it's only approved for Parkinson's and nothing else. That's how. Uh, we have a new uh, amantadine out. We had amantadine for a long time, but the current amantadine was causing a lot of problem with tolerance. They had to take it three times a day and it would go up and down in the blood. So they redesigned a special packaging for the amantadine, so it released very slowly over 18 hours or 24 hours. That seems to enhance the tolerance and also improve the benefit. And the main benefit they measured was the decrease in the dyskinesia, so you're restless in taking cinnamon whenever it peaks. And now that can be treated with the locovary. Zenigo came out, so there's this drug which is called MAOB inhibitors like Azelec, Rosagiline, or Seregiline that I use very often. And there's a third generation now. So Lezaline was first generation, Rosagiline and Azalec was second generation. And now Zadago is the third generation, Safinamide. It's out in the market. I have tried on maybe two or three patients uh, with decent results. Seems to be better tolerated. Um, deep brain stimulation. I said two new devices are out in deep brain stimulation surgery uh, where you put a wire in the brain, like a pacemaker device, and stimulate the brain. 
And um, an interesting development is that we are now part of a consortium of uh, 20 universities which will be collecting data on all these DVS studies in a very standard fashion and uh, so that we can have a common report of benefit and common understanding of what's working with DVS and what's not working and that's called RAD PD so we have been accepted in the first seven sites of RAD PD in the first launch uh, that we are very actively working on setting it up um, this is the first device with Medtronic that it's still the most commonly used device. It still works very well, but there are many enhancements to it. One enhancement uh, is uh, this new system from St. Jude or Abbott uh, device. And the, there are many differences about this device. One difference is that it's based on Apple programming. So uh, I program with an iPad uh, to connect with a Bluetooth to the device. That means you could be anywhere in the room and I can connect with you and change the setting and change the adjustment. It's an iPad, so the, uh, the view is much better, the controls are much better, and the patient has the controller, which is an iPod, and they're working on launching an app so that you would have it on your own phone on how to control and connect with your own device in a Bluetooth fashion, so you don't have to have a connector or anything else available. Are there are other changes with this device, with Apple device. So one other exciting change, if it would let me change, is that the wiring system has changed. So it used to be that the area where you stimulate at the tip of the wire was just a ring. So if you look at the first device, you will see that there are these contacts or rings where the current comes out in the brain and they were like a like a, a solid ring. And meaning that if you turn it on, the whole ring gets turned on and you get a large, like a bubble around it. What they have done is that they've broken the ring into three pieces, each controlled separately. So now you can turn on only a piece of the ring. And the advantage is that rather than having all of this stimulated, if, if you're getting problems from the left area, you can just turn on the right side and move the current all to the right of the wire so that it's more on the right side, not as much on the left side, so move it away. They call it directional stimulation, that now you can direct it to the right, to the left, to, and to forward, to back. So you can move the current back and forth a little bit. This was the original programmer that we were using uh, with Medtronic. Even Medtronic have a new programmer, but the most exciting to me so far of all the programmers I've seen is the Abbott programmer. It is much more intuitive. It's like an Apple, you know, okay, uh, Apple device. It's it's just right there. You can play around with it. You can move it around, adjust it, and it's Bluetooth connection, so you don't need a connector. So, uh, of all the programmers I personally use, I have had the most uh, ease and uh, comfort in using it. A new device is Boston Scientific. Uh, that's the third DBS system that is out. They also have wires that have the pieces on it. They also have a wire which have more than four, so they have eight connectors. Um, so that's very similar. But they have their own programming system, which is not as intuitive as the Abbott one, but it's far more detailed. So the amount of control and detail possible with the Boston device is far more than the Abbott one. So that's more for a science major, and Abbott is more for an arts major. If you want to just <laughs> But this one really makes it scientific. You can see how complicated the panels are on the right side. It's like, okay, where I need to go. But I have a video from Boston Scientific just to show you how we can now play around with the current. So this is how the stimulation happens. And you get a bulb of a current in the brain. And not only you can turn it on and off, as it will show you later on in the video, that you can move the current to one side of the wire, spin it around, take it in any direction that you want. So this was the traditional stimulation, and now it is showing you how you can spin the ball, make it in a separate shape, change it to one side or the other side with the Abbott and the Boston Scientific uh, systems. Uh, and uh, is the area you want to stimulate. If it's on one side of the wire, then you need that ability to shift it and move it to that side of the wire so you can stimulate it. You know, we try to place the wire right in the center of the place, but that's only four millimeters. So even if you're one millimeter off, you could be just on the edge of the area and, and not get it. So you need to have the ability to push the wire, the current one way or the other, you know, pull it back from one side to try to make it more accurate.
<coughs> so a lot of emerging therapies, I'm just going to list them and I'm going to details. A new Ritari is coming up, Ritari Plus, which will be even longer than the current Ritari. Uh, there's an accordion pill, I don't know if the idea is still on, if it was given up, it was once a day pill, just one pill, or early on in the last three days, one pill, and it was just like this long strip of paper, uh, absorbing all the drug, folded into a cordium, pushed in a capsule and you swallow it, and then, you know, it may be enough drug for you for three days, it's just sit in your stomach. Uh, that was one idea that was being tested. Okay, and then the new pumps are coming out. These pumps are more like insulin pump. They're making it for cinnamon, they're making it for epimorphine, and, you know, you just carry it on a belt. It's much smaller. I've seen these pumps, and it just has a glass tube. The problem is the drug doesn't last too long, so you may have to change two or three tubes every day. But it's much smaller, and then it's delivered into the skin, so you don't have to have a stomach tube or diffusion tube for the drug. You just push the needle into the skin and tape it, and then it will just run the drug into your skin. Skin absorption is still not perfect, so they're still working on it. It's in phase two right now. That's what the pump looks like uh, when you carry it with the needle there. But this is epimorphine pump, not the similar pump, which is actually in FDA review right now. It might be approved soon. And then they're looking at the DBS system to become more responsive. So right now, DBS system is fixed. You come into the doctor, we adjust the setting, and we let you go, and for the next six months, that's your setting. One step we've done is to give control to the patient, so we will make some uh, adjustment possible and allow you to do it with your own controller. The controller is getting better and better. Like Abbott one is an iPhone, so you can actually easily adjust your own stimulation. But what they want to do is for the device to sense your disease, either with a sensor that you wear on your finger, like a ring on your wrist, and you start having tremor, the DBS ramps up, tremor goes away, the DBS comes back down, or even within the brain. They want to sense the settings within the brain, so the same wire, that is giving the current is also sensing the brain and as it senses the brain is having more Parkinson's signal it will ramp up and as the Parkinson's signal goes down it will ramp back down so they're looking at these responsive DBS which I think will be out in 3 to 5 years and is the future of DBS uh, therapy I think that probably was all I had thank you so much